Hello, everybody joining us now. We're just going to give a few minutes here to let people sign into the webinar and then we'll get started. Okay, great. So it looks like everybody is joining us here for those um, just joining. Welcome. Um, thank you for taking the time. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. So hello, everybody, and welcome to Harnessing the Potential of Crossref Content Registration for Journal Discovery. My name is Danielle Padula. I head up Marketing and Community Development at Scholastica, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. We really appreciate you joining us. We have a great session for you today. So before we get started, I wanted to share a few quick housekeeping items. Today's webinar is expected to run for about 50 minutes. Following the presentations, we will have around 10 minutes for live audience Q&A. So please submit your questions at any point via the Q&A chat panel on your screen, and we'll get to all of those at the end. I also wanted to take a moment to introduce our speakers. With us, we have Anna Tolwinska, Crossref Member Experience Manager. Crossref is a leading content registration provider that makes research outputs easy to find, cite, link, assess, and reuse. Anna will be presenting ways Crossref is helping journals improve article discovery, including an overview of Crossref's latest solutions for checking metadata help, tracking citations, and linking content. We also have Brian Cody, CEO and co-founder of Scholastica. And if you're unfamiliar with Scholastica, we're a technology platform with tools and services to help journal publishers make quality research available more efficiently and affordably to facilitate a sustainable research future. Brian will be discussing the role of metadata in content registration and discovery, including best practices for making metadata deposits. So before we dive into the main discussion, I wanted to first share a quick overview of our webinar topic today. First, what do we mean by harnessing the discovery potential of Crossref? I think most are familiar with Crossref as a digital object identifier or DOI registration agency to create persistent links for journal articles. Registering DOIs for articles is a way to ensure that even if the online location of that article changes, or if there are scholars circulating different versions of the article online, readers and discovery services will always be able to easily find the official published version from the DOI link. Um, and also I will note DOIs aren't just for articles, right? They can also be applied to various other research outputs, for, but for the purposes of this conversation, speaking to journals, um, I think most are familiar with the idea of DOIs for articles. Um, so here, you know, in this example, hopefully the Golden Gate Bridge isn't moving anytime soon, but if it did and it had a DOI, you'd be able to find it. Um, and here's a quick example of a DOI from an article hosted using Scholastica's platform. Um, if we zoom in here, we can see the components. So we see that it has a persistent, um, this is the persistent crossref link made up of a prefix that crossref assigns and then a unique suffix reg registered by the publisher with accompanying metadata. And of course, it's important to remember that DOIs don't update themselves. Publishers are responsible for maintaining the metadata they register with crossref and ensuring that their DOIs link to the correct article versions. Um, but crossref content registration offers much more than that. It's also a powerful way to expand the content reach and discovery. Um, that's really what we'll be talking about today. When you join Crossref, you become part of a growing network of Crossref members from various countries. Um, and this can help your content to be found through the many discovery services using Crossref. So these are just some of the benefits we'll be digging into. Um, the ability for uh, to set up Crossref content linking, um, linking with the growing network of Crossref registered content, um, making your metadata retrievable by discovery services and research tools. And then also Crossref has many tools to see how content is being found and cited online that Anna will share. Um, and this is just a quick quote from Crossref's communications coordinator, Rosa Clark, that really reiterates the discovery potential of Crossref. And of course, the more metadata you deposit, the easier it will be for discovery tools and services to find your content and index it. So this is a quick look at what we'll cover today. We're gonna to look at how Crossref content registration helps expand the reach of research. Anna's gonna take a deep dive into Crossref metadata management and discovery tools. And then Brian will be speaking about best practices for making rich metadata deposits to maximize article discovery. Um, so now without further ado, I'm gonna hand it off to Anna to talk about Crossref discovery opportunities.
I'm not sure if you're muted, Anna. You might want to uh, turn on your. Yes, thank you so much, Tanya. <laughs> I, I was just talking to myself. Um, thank you so much for the great introduction, and I hope you can see my screen um, now. Is yeah, it, yeah okay, screen. perfect, perfect. So hi, everyone. I'm Anna Tolwinska. I'm the Member Experience Manager at Crossref. Today, um, I'll be talking to you about the importance of submitting good quality metadata and why. Okay. Um, so I'll provide a few examples of the applications of scholarly metadata and how this all helps research to be found, cited, linked to, assessed, and reused. So not just the discoverability, but many different functions that your content serves for different members of our community. I'll also chat a bit about some of the services and benefits of Crossref beyond registering content. So we're always looking for, um, so as Danielle touched upon content registration a bit earlier, but Crossref is much more than just registering the DOI. When a publisher registers a piece of research content, such as an article, um, they are required to send us basic bibliographic metadata. This includes titles, authors, publication dates, issue numbers, anything that describes the content registered. But we also collect non-bibliographic um, metadata, which is optional and many people don't know that they can actually send it to us. Uh, this can include reference lists, funding information, ORCIDs, author identifiers, license information, abstracts, and data about relationships between items. Um, so at Crossref, we have minimal requirements because we need to support a variety of different publication practices. Uh, so not every publisher can send us all of the metadata, uh, but we do ask that our members send us as much metadata as possible and to make sure it's correct and up to date. So it's the richer metadata that helps you with your content's discoverability and makes your content more useful to your readers. Um, we're always looking for what is more you know, most useful to our community. And I'll talk a lot about our community, um, this presentation. And the future, um, any future updates to our schema will be um, to support capturing community run initiatives like organizational identifiers, for example, ROAR IDs and credit contributor roles. So because Crossref's metadata is standardized and machine readable, um, it is very useful to many organizations that make content more discoverable from manuscript tracking services to library discovery tools or in metrics and analytics. The uses are vast and ever growing. And I'll show a few examples of this. Um, it is about where your metadata goes after you register it with Crossref and how uh, many other organizations then use that metadata and help researchers find the content that you publish. So I'll now provide a few examples of Crossref's metadata use in practice. And so the first example is a tool researchers and authors use. Metadata is used to match and link citations. So a specific example is Authoria, and I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, a collaborative web-based writing tool for scholarly documents such as research articles, student papers, and problem sets. Um, they built in a citation tool using Crossref's metadata so that authors can search and cite research papers without having to leave the editor. While in the middle of writing a sentence, authors can click the cite button and this citation tool opens up and speaks to Crossref to ask the relevant information for that work and then inserts the chosen citation into the text, streamlining the workflow for the researcher, making it quite easy. Another use is in aggregating and in integrating content, as well as verifying records, uh, making sure they're valid and accurate. So an example of this is on Paywall, who used the publication information, license information, and preprint links in Crossref's metadata to help find free versions of content via browser plugin uh, tool and database. And that's what the little icon um, is in your browser. If you use on Paywall, I use it and I love it. Um, it's very useful. 
Crossref metadata can help drive discovery of content on sites like Open, Science Open, a discovery platform. It helps to connect researchers to research content. Um, and articles where abstracts are available in the metadata are much more readily viewed on this platform. So we recently collaborated with I4OA, which is an initiative, is, stands for Initiative for Open Abstracts, um, which calls for publishers to submit their abstracts as part of their metadata deposits and make them um, openly available so that um, tools like this can uh, then um, use them. And here's a quote from Stephanie Dawson, the CEO of Science Open, where she mentions the impact of abstracts in discovery. Metadata 2020 is a collaboration of publishers, libraries, funders, and other organizations that advocate for richer, connected, and reusable open metadata as a resource for researchers and scholarly community as a whole. So richer metadata fuels discovery and innovation, you know, connected metadata bridge, connected metadata bridges and gaps between systems and communities and reusable open metadata eliminates duplication of effort. So all good things come from more um, up-to-date metadata. And another uh, community-driven effort is a research org uh, registry. It's uh, where Crossref is part of it. Um, there are currently led, um, currently there are four other organizations or three other organizations in addition to Crossref, California Digital Library, Data Site and Digital Science. And the project is aimed specifically on addressing a basic and high level affiliation use case. So what organizations are affiliated with what research outputs, uh, providing a clear disambiguation of these organization names and uh, making it easier um, for researchers uh, and for anyone to know which research goes with which organization. And we will be accepting RUR IDs in the future in Crossref. So you'll be able to submit that um, in addition to all the other persistent IDs that uh, you already do. So one thing worth mentioning is that people think Crossref members have a defined set of metadata and that our metadata is complete and fully comprehensive. But that is not exactly the case. Um, this is more the reality of some of our members. Um, so they aren't able to send us many chunks of the metadata, uh, maybe because they don't have it. Sometimes they can't afford to send it to us because of um, maybe it's too expensive through their vendors. Uh, sometimes they don't recognize the value in sending it to Crossref. Um, and sometimes they're simply not aware that they are uh, what they are sending us. So um, they may need uh, additional information about what they can send to us. So now you're probably wondering what key metadata elements you are registering with Crossref and what type of zebra you are. I'm going to show you one of our tools called Participation Reports. And it's a place where you can see what metadata you're registering with us and fix any gaps. You can track your progress. So if you start registering references, you can see them grow uh, in the report. And you can, you're can you able to see how you measure up to other members. So this is an example of a member's report. This is Hindawi, a large uh, open access publisher. Uh, they have a very good um, looking participation report, a uh, lot of co coverage. Um, but you can do, you can see where the gaps are. So uh, some of the funding information is missing and that may be because they just don't have it. Um, they're not yet participating or not participating in cross marks. So you see a zero there, but all the other key elements um, seem uh, have very, very good coverage. Another example of a much smaller organization with excellent coverage is National Institute for Health Research. Um, they are not the typical uh, member because most of our members don't submit as much, um, but this is a very um, a good example to aspire to. And now I'll walk you through uh, the report. So when you type in your uh, organization name, when you go to the report, you'll end up on this main page 
And each item has a more information icon button next to it, the little eye, that when clicked on will display um, an explanation of each of the indicators with links to more information and also um, information about why it's important to submit that piece of content. Uh, you can also view the report by content type. So you can choose journal articles or book chapters, books, depending on what you're submitting to Crossref. And on the, uh, you can also search by title. So if you have multiple titles, you can uh, enter a title and just look at the coverage of uh, for that one journal. It's really useful for your editors, uh, for example. And then on the right hand side, you can change the date range. So it defaults to current content, which is the year that we're in and two previous years. But you can also look at back files, which is anything prior to the current content or all time. Um, and it will also show you how many total items you have registered in Crossref. Um, so it's just important to remember that uh, your report may not look perfect, but that's OK. And also, if you don't have the metadata, um, if you don't collect it, uh, if you're a humanities publisher, you might not have funding information, it's OK. And um, you should just register what you can. So our goal is to help members make their metadata look like this. So collecting all relevant metadata and connecting this to the larger community uh, communications landscape. Um, but we want all members to be able to send us metadata that is connected, standardized, optimized to site, link, and assess. So what can you do? Um, these are some of the things that you, you should think about and maybe um, take as takeaways. Uh, so make your references open if they're not, and you'll be able to tell from the report um, because open references might have a zero next to them. Uh, provide license information, include funding information if applicable, uh, use ROAR identifiers when we start collecting them, and of course, encourage your authors to submit ORCIDs and use ORCID auto update um, and cite data if applicable. So now that we've covered, uh, I know this was a whirlwind tour of metadata. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit um, more um, about the useful uh, uh, usefulness of other services that Crossref uh, provides. So as I mentioned previously, Crossref is much more than just registering your DOIs. So a big benefit of being a Crossref member is that you're part of this collaborative network. And this in turn allows for Crossref members to have access to a variety of services that help uh, record, link, and distribute the metadata uh, of, of your academic research. I'm going to describe each briefly and explain how they can help with the quality and discovery of your content. So first up, we have reference linking. Um, reference linking means including Crossref DOIs when you create your citation list. This enables researchers to follow a link from a reference list to other full text documents, helping them make connections and discover new things. And because it's um, a DOI rather than just a link. Uh, as Danielle mentioned, it will remain persistent and you'll be able to find uh, the content. So this solution makes it possible for readers to follow a DOI link from the reference list of published works to the location of the full text document on a, another member's publishing platform, building a network infrastructure that enhances scholarly communications on the web because DOI links don't break over time. And I have an exam, a few examples here. Um, it, reference linking is an obligation if you're a Crossref member. Um, so um, you need to start within 18 months of your membership, but it's, it's really useful. And I just wanted to point out um, Crossref, this particular publisher has two Crossref DOI links. So one is a URL listed here, and one is the word Crossref hyperlinked with the DOI. Um, you can also um, include other links as well as this member is doing. And here's another example. Um, and you might notice, and I didn't know this when I took the screenshot, but there is a famous uh, second uh, citation starts with a really famous author <laughs> right there. Um, 
uh, and it also includes a link, a hyperlink DOI. Okay, so moving on, a good next step once you are reference linking um, is to look into participating in our Cited By service. So Cited By allows you to uh, show researchers which article cited your article. It helps to be able to see how researchers continue to develop their ideas. This is the main function of Cited By, show the number of citations and link to the publications that cite your article. And all you need to do is register your references as part of the metadata. So when you're doing content registration, you need to register your references and then request this information from Crossref by querying our APIs and then uh, display it on your website in whatever format you like. Uh, this is an example um, of a publisher that um, is displaying the cited by links here. And when you click on that, you can uh, see the list of all of the um, articles that cited this article. So that's a way to do it. I'm going to see if I can. Oh, I can enter full screen. Great. Um, OK, next up, we have Similarity Check. Similarity Check offers publishers a way to actively engage in efforts to prevent plagiarism. So it's a service um, that helps editors uh, see whether they're uh, whether the content is original. Uh, to do this, our members are given access to Turnitin's powerful text comparison tool called Authenticate so that they can compare their own manuscripts against the largest comparison database of full text academic content in the world. Um, similarity check uh, members have a reduced fee. It costs 20% of your annual Crossref fee to participate in similarity check. And then there are per document checking fees um, and we can share that um, later on with anyone that's interested. Um, and uh, the, the fee is reduced because Authenticate um, members have to contribute to uh, with their own full text content into Turnitin's database of full text literature. This means that as the number of similarity check members grow, so does the size of the Authenticate content database and more content in the data database means greater peace of mind for editors looking to determine uh, a manuscript's originality. And this is how um, this, the service works. Um, really kind of basic explanation of it, but um, you upload a document to Authenticate and then a similarity report is produced. You compare it side by side, and it's the editor that makes a decision about um, the similarity detected, whether it's legitimate or whether further investigation is required. And then uh, when members publish new content, they provide a link to their full text, which turn it in, use to index the item and add it into their database. Next up, we have um, Crossmark. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about managing changes to content and how our Crossmark service helps with this. So after, uh, uh, after it's published, content changes quite frequently, um, also depending on the type of content that you publish, but uh, readers need to know. Um, it could be an update or a correction, which are quite common. Less common are retractions, um, but they have been reported and sometimes articles need to be withdrawn and it's not easy to tell sometimes. So um, an easy way would be to include it in Crossref's metadata. Um, and that way that information is available to anyone that might be interested. Uh, so readers definitely need to know that they can trust and use the research. It also helps to maintain the scholarly record. And this is an important jobs for publishers to do. And um, so Crossmark works in a way, in two ways. One way is on your article pages, uh, you can include a button for HTML and PDF that when clicked shows the researcher information, whether the article has been updated or changed since it was published. Um, of course, the information stays with the article and can be accessed even um, away from the publisher site because there is machine readable metadata available via Crossref REST 
API. So it's not just on the article page, but it's also in uh, Crossref's metadata. And I'll um, just show you a few examples. Uh, if you click on the button and the article is current, then you'll get a green document is current update. If there are updates, um, then it'll be yellow and it, you will see um, there's gonna be a link to the uh, updated version or there may be a retraction and there's also a link to that. And all of this lives in Crossref's metadata and Crossmark is free for members to use. And um, the last and the most recent new, newer service that we have, and we're still kind of working on it, so please bear with us, is Event Data. So Event Data uncovers links between Crossref registered DOIs and diverse places where they're mentioned across the internet. Some of those places are Twitter, Wikipedia, Reddit, and various blogs. Uh, we make the events available through our API, so you need to query for it. There's no really easy interface to use. Um, and then some of the uses for event data, um, authors can find out where their work has been reused and commented on. Uh, readers can access more context around published research. Uh, publishers and funders can assess the impact of published research. So there are many different uh, varied uses for event data. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. So I just wanted to leave you with three takeaways. Um, metadata makes your content more useful and easier to find. Uh, register as much metadata as possible to help research discoveries happen faster. And we're all part of a community. Uh, which is smart alone, but brilliant together. And that is me. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, Anna. That was great. Um, and now we'll hand it off to Brian to talk about metadata management. Great, thank you. And then can you both hear me and see my screen? Yes. Yes. Perfect, thanks. So um, I'll start by saying, as Anna mentioned, you can put sort of minimal metadata into Crossref or you can deposit sort of lots of metadata. Um, a major question we hear from small and medium-sized publishers is does additional metadata really make much of a difference for discoverability? It's definitely more work. So is it worth it to us as the publisher who have limited staff and resources? Uh, I think the sort of short answer is yes. Uh, because, why? Because it creates more opportunities for your content to be discovered. This is especially important given emerging ways machines are helping organize and surface research to scholars. And metadata, again, as Anna mentioned, is really great for machines. It's very machine readable, even if we humans don't look at it much. Uh, Anna also mentioned sometimes publishers don't send metadata to Crossref because they don't know about it. They're not really looking at the machine readable um, content or they don't realize that the metadata is not being sent. So. Uh, with all that in mind, I'm gonna share some of what we've learned as a platform provider working with publishers to collect, structure, enhance, and ultimately deposit their metadata into Crossref and share some suggestions for improving uh, discoverability. So before getting into the nitty gritty of specific recommendations, I wanted to have a working analogy for the discoverability ecosystem. The kind of key question is how do discovery services, Crossref, and metadata preparation all work together. So one way to think about uh, this whole scholarship discovery process is like one of those massive antique fairs or flea markets. Um, if you haven't been to one of these, there are sometimes thousands of booths. Uh, here's one I've been, been to, it's in Elkhorn, uh, Wisconsin. And there are so many booths, you can't see everything. And so shoppers generally have to strategize to find uh, the things they're gonna want because they can't sort of browse everything. That is meant to be somewhat analogous to researchers. They can't look at millions of articles. They're going to have targeted searches. And many of the people showing up to these antique fairs, they're very specialized collectors. They're looking only for maybe Victorian bookmarks or vintage science fiction novels or antique hand tools or maybe vintage suitcases. Those four examples, by the way, are all things I personally like to look for when I go. So in this analogy, um, article, excuse me, articles are really the booths at the fair. Uh, maybe they're the individual antique, but we're just gonna say booths. Um, and discovery services 
are the savvy shoppers. Now, Crossref in this analogy is the organizer of the event. And what's crucial here is that they also make a guide. So you can think of that as a map, um, but something they do that's really important is uh, they include an index. So it's not just a map showing where your booth is, it is actually uh, a list where um, of booths by interest area. So your booth can be listed multiple times. Um, that way more people can come find your booth. So again, Crossref organizes it and creates this uh, index for people. So this table of contents that they can use to find booths. And software uh, providers like Scholastica would be in this analogy like lots of clerks processing each antique, entering, entering each item into a spreadsheet, then sending that information to Crossref so they know where to put your booth in their printed guide. Your goal is to be enlisted as many of the relevant categories as possible in that guide. So people come to your booth and find what they want. Great. So now uh, let's talk about discoverability in action. How do shoppers actually find stuff? Um, so both the antique fair and drawing on how scholarship works, there's a few ways they could do this. They could say, um, have you seen uh, Ant's Teak Furniture booth? In this example, they're using the title. Another one is they could maybe use a keyword, like look in the index under teak furniture. Um, so again, using a keyword. Um, they could also describe the booth to somebody such as, oh, it's, it's, it's this furniture store that sells teak furniture. It's run by three women who through a series of improbable marriages are all each other's aunts. So that would be like your abstract. And all these are different ways people could find the booth. Um, but one problem is, and think about the title, this could actually send someone to one of the other 200 teak furniture booths. So really, if they wanna find your specific booth, what they need is a unique booth number and a map. So think about this being a map of the fair and you have these numbers for the different booths, you need one of those. That's like your article's DOI. It's a very important piece of information. Without that, they might not find you specifically, even when they think they are. If they put in all your information, like Ant's Teak Furniture um, booth, it could ultimately take them somewhere else. But if they have that unique number, they know they're gonna get there. Okay, so let's go back to the antique fair. People can do other kinds of searches. So they might be only looking for books by a specific writer. They're a, maybe a rare book collector. This would be like your orchid ID. Um, and they're gonna be very specific, right? They're gonna know whether the author, you know, um, uh, is in the right genre or not. And the ORCID ID helps if you have two Susan Johnsons, help make sure it's the right one. So the ORCID ID helps when people are doing these kinds of searches. And we might be familiar, sometimes people do the research projects, these sort of meta-analyses using millions of authors. And the ORCID ID is really important in that to disaggregate those uh, names that are seem similar or that could be vague as professors move around to different institutions, even a name plus the name of university might not be uniquely identifying somebody. Someone at this fair could also say, you know, I'm really looking for to buy honey from that farm I passed on the way in and only that farm. So this is like, they want it from a specific institution. So institutional identifiers like ROAR, that's a way people might be searching for things. So if you include those institutional identifiers in your metadata, uh, those can go forward. As Anna mentioned, ROAR is one of the things uh, they'll be adding at Crossref. Someone might only want to visit booths that are uh, supported by nonprofits or artisans. So you can think about this as sort of that funder information. So grant information, grant numbers, but also the FundRef IDs. Um, and there's lots of, think about with COVID-19, lots of analyses going on, people looking at who's funding what kind of research. Well, if your article doesn't have that kind of information, it's not gonna end up in those analyses, it won't get cited. At this um, antique fair, people might also be looking for raw materials. They don't wanna buy um, you know, wool dresses, they wanna make their own. So you can think about that as data citations. People are looking for links to the actual data. And so that's using um, in the chats, there's a um, data citation tag but also fair data practices, if you're not familiar with fair, um, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable data. Um, there's some practices there that can help. Okay, so trying to continue that analogy. Um, imagine if someone said, oh, you must go to the antique barn. It was amazing. I might respond, wait, which one? There are like 
12 booths called Antique Barn. Uh, that's a recommendation, right? Someone's telling me about this booth I should see. Uh, but a recommendation really relies on enough information so that others get to the exact right place. Um, and ultimately, the best recommendation is going to be a booth number. This is really how citations work. And you think about having uh, references having the metadata, your citations having metadata. If someone says you should read the 1989 work by uh, John Matthews, well, what if this person had 10 works that year? Or what if you put 89, but it was published in December and some places the electronic version showed, well, 1989, I don't know if there would have been electronic, but it might have gone out in 1990. So the DOI is a way to again disaggregate and make sure you're getting to the exact correct work. Um, one other thing is if someone cites that, a lot of these discoverability services can help you know that that work was cited. So if someone cites your work with your DOI, that can go into, again, lots of these different citation databases. Um, it's one of the reasons you should also be including your references as metadata, because with things like, as Anna mentioned, CrossRef's Cited By program, you can contribute to this world where people know when others are citing their works. That also can long-term, I think, help build um, a more open version of citation databases. Um, if you're familiar with this, these are often very costly and proprietary. And so being able to have other ways or working with nonprofits to develop this is, uh, I think, really good. So at this point, you might be thinking, great, Brian, uh, okay analogy, but what are we supposed to do with that? We can't even go to an antique fair because of this pandemic. Great point. So here are some takeaways uh, to help you on your discoverability improvement journey. So first, the more metadata you provide, the more opportunities to be discovered. I said this sort of out of the gate, and I think it really is one of the important punchlines here. As we saw with the antique fair analogy, the more metadata you provide to Crossref, the more ways discover, discovery services can use your data to find what they're looking for, especially if they're relying on machine readable metadata. Those different shoppers who are coming with all these specific ways of looking for content, if you have metadata, they can hook into that. If you don't have the metadata, they're not going to be able to come to your booth. Also remember, you don't have control over what, where the metadata goes or how it gets used or how that turns into surfacing content for other scholars. But what you can control is, is sort of knowing that it's going to go really far and, and any errors or missing data is going to go with it. So if you can add more data and avoid errors, um, that's something you can control and that any improvement you make is going to travel across hundreds of discoverability services. One nice thing, and Anna talked about this, is Crossref has some great diagnostics that show sort of how your metadata is doing, those um, participation reports. And some of these, you know, depending on where you are, you might feel like, great, we're doing all of these. You might also say, oh, some of these aren't even really that familiar, though after Anna's presentation, they probably are now. Um, but you know, depending on how you feel, that might lead to our next takeaway, which is don't be overwhelmed. So at Scholastica, we often talk about Agile, capital A Agile, which is a software development methodology, but we also use it for projects. And one of the key tenants there is to deliver value frequently, which software folks often accomplish uh, by completing small improvements, shipping that code out to the world so users can experience the value as quickly as possible. And you can contrast that with spending years on a huge plan with lots of improvements, but no one really gets any benefit until after all the work's done. They don't they don't realize value along the way. This is also a really good way to approach metadata improvement. Figure out what an achievable improvement is and focus on that. Celebrate when it's done, then pick the next improvement. I like to encourage publishers to identify the lowest hanging fruit. What's the easiest improvement to make for your metadata based on where you are right now? So even if you feel like ORCID is the most important um, metadata to add, uh, and, but maybe license URLs are easier, do that first, get the win. Uh, so some examples from working with publishers, Anna talked about some of the different fields. If you don't have abstracts in your jets, that's probably not too hard to add. Those are sort of usually front and center. Um, they're very accessible. Um, if your content all uses the same license, so some publishers, you know, it's all going to be the same or it's 99% of the time it's the same license, that could really be a good way to add license URLs, hard coded, and you only have to deal with it if it's an exception. Um, if you're doing references and they're not open, as Anna mentioned, it, it might be pretty easy to, to change that um, with Crossref and in your JATS. 
sort of even separately from sending the metadata through to Crossref, collecting it is a place I would encourage people to start. You could start collecting ORCID IDs at submissions, even if you don't put it in the JATS yet, or if you can't verify it. So it's an author hand coding it. Uh, step one is at least get people thinking about putting it in or maybe signing up. And then next you can verify it and then include it in your JATS. Um, another example might be collecting funding awards um, numbers and the like grant numbers and institutional funders at submission. And again, even if you know you're not going to put in the JATS right away, starting to collect it and signaling to your author base these are things you want to collect can be really important. DOIs are a must. So if I go back to the antique fair analogy, if, if you don't have a booth number, it really limits how people can find you. Um, and we're sort of in the context of sending metadata to Crossref, that DOI being a core node for where the metadata live, probably makes sense. But you know, if you haven't started with this, start by issuing DOIs, and that's the place to put lots of this metadata. Um, it also helps with, uh, again, those citations, because uh, I can talk about at Scholastica, we sometimes see articles uh, that come in where, the, for example, a reference has a DOI, and we can confidently match that that reference is the one the author provided and check all the metadata against a source like Crossref and, and identify um, and improve errors. For example, if the year was wrong, um, if they said it was 95, it was actually 96. But without the DOI, it's a lot harder to improve those because again, there might be similarities that it's difficult to disaggregate. And we're talking about thousands or tens of thousands or millions of articles, it's hard to sort of manually fix those. And DOIs are a core way um, to sort of scale up um, improve the improvement in the quality of metadata. Um, great, so another one is, takeaway is automate whenever possible. So if you've ever manually registered DOIs by filling out a form, uh, it takes time. It's also prone to error, human error, copy and pasting. I've spoken with managing editors who get behind on depositing full metadata in a Crossref, even when they have it, because they wanna get the DOI right away so they can include that in the PDF, um, so they put into Crossref basic info like the title and maybe the, main, the primary author, but they, they don't get around to going back and adding all the other metadata, the abstract, uh, or maybe that's required, I don't actually remember, but things like um, publication date, references, all of that. And so they end up with a very minimal entry in Crossref's database, and which is, as we've talked about with the antique fair analogy, that can really limit discovery. Different ways people are looking for data, well, the metadata aren't there, and so machine augmented research isn't gonna interact with your work very much. Uh, to solve this, one thing I would encourage you to do is check with all your vendors to see if they can do something. Sometimes, and this is you know, unfortunately not always the case, but sometimes there's a box you can check and one of your software platforms or vendors can sort of improve your metadata without um, any additional work because they're already doing it for other people. Depositing metadata might be easier for, for example, your typesetting service or your um, software platform, and so it's worth checking. For example, I know Open Journal Systems um, has a DOI integration with Crossref. Janeway, which is out of the University of London, um, and it's also used by the Open Library of Humanities. And uh, of course, here at Scholastica, uh, we all have ways to automate depositing uh, rich metadata into Crossref. Collecting metadata at the moment of ingest, so that's during the submission process, is really much easier than trying to collect or enhance that data during production. Authors are really motivated to get you everything you want when they're submitting. And then chasing metadata alongside proof edits can add a lot of noise to an already noisy production and proofing process. One idea is to see if you can add fields to your submission form. We talked about ORCID ID or funding information. Start as text fields and eventually use APIs and data sets to verify and normalize those. Um, along with, you know, Roll or Fun Ref and Orchid. A uh, final takeaway is to focus on the future. This kind of relates to the idea of not being overwhelmed and being agile. And what I'm going to say might be controversial, but I, I recommend if you're thinking about improving your metadata, start by ignoring all your old incomplete metadata on your existing articles and instead focus only on new articles. Old data cleanup can be a separate project. It can also be a huge project. And we don't want it to stand in the way of making improvements to your metadata. So I would encourage make a small step towards improving your metadata on your next article or your next issue, celebrate that, continue to improve, 
and know that at some point it'll make sense to say, oh, we have really great metadata for our current articles. Let's start the project of going back and enhancing old articles. If you want to have both new and old articles enhanced at the same time, that can be such a big project, you never have bandwidth to actually start it. So um, in, in closing, even though I use an analogy full of antiques to talk about the discovery process, rich metadata really enables some cutting edge scholarship and discovery. Uh, the discovery ecosystem is where software like Scholastica helps you collect and prepare all your metadata and send it to Crossref. Crossref helps make it available to discovery services in a standardized way. And discovery services use it in all kinds of interesting ways to connect scholars to your content. Um, it's a really, this, this ecosystem is really changing rapidly as machine readable metadata is being used more and more by research and discovery tools. So if you enrich your metadata, along with increasing your changes at discovery, so making your content more discoverable, which helps with citations, which helps improve um, scholarship, you'll also be contributing to increasing the pace of scholarship, that the pace of science itself will increase because these new kinds of research can do more when there's more metadata. So I'll stop there. Thank you. And I look forward to questions. Awesome. Thanks so much, Brian and Anna, for those great presentations. And we do have some questions coming in here. Um, for those watching, if you have a question you'd like to ask, please feel free to go ahead and put that in the Q&A chat panel at the bottom of your screen, and we'll start um, responding to those. And I'll go ahead and just share my screen um, here to show our uh, Twitter handles as well. So if you want to uh, follow uh, Scholastica and Crossref on Twitter, um, we'll be you know, posting some uh, takeaways from the webinar and uh, can address any kind of questions that uh, maybe we don't get to here. Oop, that's not the screen I wanna show you. <laughs> um, here we go. Oh, okay. All right, great. So I'm going to go ahead and look at the Q&A, which hopefully I can do. Yes, I can with the screen. Okay, great. Um, so the first question that we have here is what is ROAR? Oh, sure, I can take that. Um, so ROAR is a, a stands for Research Organization Registry, and it's a new initiative. Um, as I mentioned uh, in the presentation, it was um, a, a collaboration between Crossref, Digital Science, California Digital Library, and um, Oh, there's one more and I can't think of it right now, but um, it uh, it's going to help um, uh, alleviate the affiliation um, uh, issue. Uh, so a lot of organizations have similar names. Um, so just as ORCID uh, identifiers are for authors, ROAR IDs will be for uh, um, institutions. Um, so we're hoping to uh, make that much easier where authors and uh, research outputs will be able to connect with um, a ROAR ID of their institution. And just from a technical standpoint, for people who are familiar with this, or and, and uh, Roar, I guess, Anna, you can check me on this. Roar is built on top of Grid, correct? Yes. And then that also includes ISNI numbers, so the International Standard Name Identifier. Yes. Is that right? So I think it was built on um, some of that, but I I will post. Um, in the chat room, uh, a link to the Roar page, just so we provide up-to-date information. And, and I just, I mentioned that because if you're interested in that standard, it should have some crosswalking if you have any um, other sort of institutional identifiers, uh, which can be helpful. And you can search up your institution's names. I believe uh, you should already have an Aurora assigned to your institution name. And if you find any issues with the metadata, um, please contact Roar um, and have it fixed. And we will be including ROARs in Crossref's metadata, uh, hopefully by the end of this year. Awesome. And a related question to that, um, someone asked, do most authors know their institution's ROAR? I guess that would depend, but maybe do you have any advice on how to make sure that authors can get that? Probably not at this point, uh, but hopefully um, soon um, they'll be included in uh, manuscript, um, you know, submission systems and uh, will be integrated by a lot of the vendors um, and it will be much easier for um, authors and for publishers to submit them. Right, and, and what I would expect is that people would not be entering in a number, they'd be doing a search yeah. and it would come up and they would select. So um, I, I, I don't think we have to worry too much about people memorizing that number, which is good. True. Um, 
Okay, so a separate question here. Um, if a journal owner changes publishers, how can it change the publisher name at Crossref? Uh, so if a journal name, uh, so journal transfers, like a title transfer can occur and they can, um, so the, the publisher that is moving the title to another publisher would have to send us an email to crossref member at crossref.org let us know that they are you know giving permission for that title to switch uh, ownership and we would then move that um, and move for example the prefix over to if that's the case but uh, we can provide more information um, if you email us at member at crossref.org but yet title transfers happen all the time between publishers? Sure, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and another question I have here, are there any plug-in solutions to help collect metadata during the submission process? I, I think it depends on where, where you're collecting that. Um, I mean, there's, I mean, obviously there's lots of peer review submission platforms. And so that's one place that they're going to have that. Um, if you're using a system like OGS, you know, there's different plugins you can add. I also, I mean, I've seen people do things with um, Google Forms and for example, have sort of create these huge arrays of items that people have to choose from. Um, but I think it really is gonna depend on how you're collecting information. Anna, does that match your experience? Yeah, yeah, I would say so. Uh, the only, I guess, for example, OJS has a Crossref plugin, um, uh, but I can't really think of any other ones offhand. Um, we we just have the web tools that you know uh, that we provide um, to enter metadata in. But yeah, I think that's that's pretty good. Sure. And then a separate question here. Um, this person says, our journal just joined Crossref. Can we assign DOI numbers to articles in archival issues and file their metadata? Uh, yes. So uh, anything that, um, any uh, articles that go back as far, you know, back as possible, we have content, I believe that dates back to the 1500s or maybe even before then. So yes, you can assign uh, DOIs to back file content um, and it actually costs less than uh, current content. So it's only 15 cents, I believe, to register uh, back file content. And back file this year is considered, um, so current is the year that we're in and two prior years. So um, back file starts in 2018. So any content starting in 2018 that was published in 2018 and back all the way back, you know, to the early, uh, uh, as far back as you can possibly go, I guess, um, is 15 cents per DOI. And then depending on if you're working with someone, sometimes uh, people can help you do that in bulk. So get your data formatted. Um, and a Crossref has um, a bulk upload right yes if you uh, uh create xml like mm -hmm. a xml file you can submit uh a lot of files as one um into our admin system and i know for example we've worked with people on that where they have some kind of structured data and it might even be they have a csv or an old database and try and help them get that into a format into crossref versus having to hand punch that depending on if your archive um, could be <laughs> really expansive. Yeah, that's right. Although Crossref does not, um, uh, you're not able to, to do that uh, in Crossref. So you'd have to do it on your own. Uh, there are certain uh, pieces of metadata that you can upload um, with a CSV file. So for example, if you're updating uh, URLs just uh, to mm -hmm. DOIs, you could submit a CSV file with a bulk upload of, you know, um, hundreds or even thousands of DOIs with new URLs, but that is very limited. So you, you would have to work with someone to create um, a bulk um, XML file. Right, yeah, and just, just to make sure you have that clarification is, you, right, you have to work with someone, as Anna said, like we've worked with people to take their CSVs or databases, put it into XML. So yeah, I didn't want to set the expectation that Crossref has that on their site. Sure, and then um, another question relating to automation. Um, does Scholastica deposit references using the automatic DOI integration with Crossref? I don't know. 
know. It either does or that's in progress. Um, I know the I, the references, because I know we've been speaking with Crossref about making it really easy for everyone to, who, who we work with to be able to participate in Cited By. And so um, I actually don't remember. Again, it either does or it, it will soon. Um, and Anna, I would assume you don't know about us, but no. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll check. I, I, yeah, again, I, either yes or very soon. Okay, and I know we're um, about at time here, so I'm just going to um, make room for two more questions. Um, one question kind of general, um, where can I find FAIR data? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, maybe, Anna, I don't know if there's a way to know if data um, is here within Crossref. So FAIR data is uh, basically data that's, um, that meets principles of findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability, and I feel like all a lot of the data in Crossref is that way. Um, so um, I'm not sure what exactly the question uh, pertains to, but I don't know if Brian, you have. Yeah, I, yeah again, we, one other option is within specific fields, there are data repositories. Um, so data site and um, the American Geophysical Union, they have a data repository uh, finder that you can use and there's about I think 1800 repositories you can, and, and those are sort of meet the fair data principles. So depending on what your field is, um, I mean, there might be places like Dryad, which is a great um, curated data repository system that people can go to look for existing data, but also again, your specific discipline might have data repositories that uh, sort of meet the fair principles and scholars can look in that to find existing data sets. Uh, I'll, I'll share the URL for that in with the question um, in just a moment. Thanks, Brian. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And last question here. If a publisher had to prioritize only three metadata fields, what would you say are the top ones to use? Anna, I really oh, want to hear your answer to this. <laughs> so I, I'd say references. That would be my number one choice. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, um, Orchids and licenses, <laughs> but of course now we're we're collecting abstracts. It's it's very hard to say, uh, but yeah, definitely um, uh, references, orchids, and abstracts. <laughs> that would be my my go to. Um, but license data is very important. A lot of the the things that I mentioned run off of license information. So. Yeah, I I was thinking about this recently with even if you ever search for images to use, like you can use Google Image Search or Unsplash or all these sites, you you know, if you might want to filter those to be ones that you can re legally reuse. And I think about the same thing with scholarship or data. If there's no license, you sort of don't know what you can do with it. And you know, and, and so if people are filtering searches to content that has a particular license uh, and there's no license, that sort of kicks it out of the search. So I agree. And as I mentioned, a lot of publishers we work with, the licenses don't change too frequently. Uh, or it's just across three options, right? And so it's something that ideally is not too onerous to put in there. It's just not something I think historically people worried about, um, especially when it was print focused, right? That didn't really matter. But I, I agree with that, Anna. Awesome. Um, well, with that, uh, we're going to wrap up here. Um, I want to thank everybody for taking the time to join us today. Thank you to our speakers. Um, and as you can see on the slides here, if you have additional questions, thoughts, comments related to the webinar, feel free to tweet at us. Um, you can find uh, Crossref and Slask on Twitter. And also um, be sure to explore the other many great resources available on this topic. Crossref has a plethora of great you know, literature on all the different tools that Anna discussed. Um, certainly you can you know, dig in much further with all of that, as she said. Um, and Slaska, we also have a blog where we're frequently um, creating new content related to journal discovery and metadata. So be sure to check out those resources available to you. And otherwise, we hope you have a great rest of the day. Thank you for joining us here. Yes. Bye, everybody. Thank Bye. you, Danielle. Thank you, Brian. Thank you.